Welcome to Community Health Matters. I'm your host, Kristen Presall. Research into the causes, prevention, and treatment of breast cancer is being done in medical centers around the world, including right here in Middle Tennessee. Patty Harmon of Komen Greater Nashville and Dr. Deborah Lanigan from Vanderbilt University join us to talk about the current research into the causes of breast cancer. As we age, it's important to know how to live well, access services, and remain active and involved. Janet Jernigan of 54 Forward joins us to talk about how to continue to make the most of life from age 50 on. Measles, a disease once considered eradicated in the U.S., has been making a comeback in the first two months of 2015. 170 people from 17 states were reported to have been diagnosed with measles. State epidemiologist Dr. Tim Jones talks to us about vaccines for measles and other preventable diseases. All of that coming up next on Community Health Matters. Did you know getting regular exercise is important for the continued health of breast cancer survivors? Physical activity can help lessen certain side effects of treatment, such as fatigue and depression, and has been shown to reduce the risk of recurrence and improve survival. It's important for good health for all of us to live an active lifestyle. And now breast cancer survivors have even greater motivation to make regular exercise a habit. To learn more on maintaining a healthy weight and diet, visit Komen.org. So many of you know about the fight against breast cancer. In fact, many of you have probably even donated to organizations that help with that fight. Today, we're going to talk specifically about research behind breast cancer and how important it is. And I have two excellent guests joining me today to talk more extensively about that. We want to welcome Ms. Patty Harmon, who is the executive director of the Susan G. Komen Greater Nashville Area Chapter. And then we also want to welcome Dr. Deborah Lanigan, who's an associate professor over at Vanderbilt University and deals specifically with the research. So welcome, ladies. Pleasure. We're so glad to have you here. I know that Susan G. Komen's involvement uh, in the fight against breast, breast cancer and also supporting these breast cancer patients is just crucial and it's amazing what you all have done over the years. Tell us though how research figures into the overall mission. So for us our goal is to eliminate breast cancer and in order to eliminate breast cancer we have to have research. Research is vital um, in, in making or allowing us to get to the point where breast cancer does not exist. That's great. When we're talking specifically about statistics, a lot of folks don't necessarily know how many people have breast cancer. And I don't know if one of you ladies can talk statistics for us, please. Certainly. So um, breast cancer is the second cause of cancer among women. And overall, a woman has a one in eight chance of being diagnosed with breast cancer over her lifetime. So we're making great strides in treatment, and that's evidenced by the fact that there's 2.8 million breast cancer survivors in the U.S. But what well, we still have a lot of work to do because 40,000 women die each year from breast cancer. Do we know, uh, Dr. Lanigan, what causes breast cancer? That's a great question. We know a small percentage of breast cancers are caused by genetically inherited diseases. But overall, we really don't know what the, the causes are. But we can work on uh, providing ourselves with the best health possible by eating right, exercising, going to our physician, and having a good social network. Okay, we wanna talk, like I said, specifically about research. Why research? I mean, what are we trying to learn with this research? So basically, research provides cures. So the goal of current breast cancer researchers is to really find those new cures with our ultimate goal of really preventing breast cancer. All right, I understand that Komen funded breast cancer research is being done right here in Middle Tennessee at Vanderbilt University, and that's, that's what you do. Kind of explain that, how it kind of all works together, if you don't mind. Uh, absolutely, so it's my pleasure to have a Komen grant in collaboration uh, with Ian McCara. And so our grant is about, uh, first of all, we're developing a novel drug that was isolated from a plant found only in the South American rainforest, and that we wow. think will be useful for the treatment of breast cancer metastasis. And the second part of our work is that we're really trying to develop a better way to test drugs before they go into the, the clinical stage of testing. And we use as a model system is living human breast cancer tissue. So not only is that going to be a new way for testing drugs, but we want to be able to evolve it into a personalized medicine approach uh, for women being treated. All right. What is it in particular that uh, we're trying to learn, though, specifically with your Vanderbilt research? 
well, we, I want to uh, move this drug into the clinic and I want to be able to uh, identify what are the basic causes. There's different types of breast cancer. They all have different underlying causes. So I focus mainly on triple negative breast cancer, which tragically strikes young women and has a very poor prognosis. And there's currently no um, really good targeted therapies available for it. So that's my primary interest, and that's what my Coleman grant's about. I think people are fascinated in the research aspect. If you don't yeah. mind answering this question too, um, specifically in your lab, because for folks who might not be able to ever go visit one of those labs, talk a little bit about how many people you work with and who's trying to actually strive to make this goal happen. So I have six people in my lab, and we all focus on breast cancer research. Okay. But I also have a collaborator. I have uh, breast cancer surgeons and pathologists that I work with because we have a constant need for, for living tissue. And uh, so it's a whole team, and Ian McCara's team has about 12 people on it, and all his people work on breast cancer research. So we're just um, one group whose you know, quest is to really identify what are the causes of breast cancer in triple negative breast cancer. Are you meeting on a weekly basis? How oh, does yes. the operation uh, work? Well, then? so, so my yes, uh, we have a close connections with my collaborator and phone calls and emails. And of course, I meet with my people every day. I mean, that's what's the great thing about science is there's always new discoveries and thinking about them and you go home thinking about them, you know, because we're really very passionate about, you know, we want to find a cure. We want to help people. And I think all breast cancer researchers, all researchers are like that. Yeah, behind the scenes though, I mean, you just can't be trying to explain to folks I imagine it's pretty exciting to to let people know exactly what you're doing back there you know because like I said no one really be has the opportunity right. to go back into a lab so being able to hear from someone who actually does the research is just so important so amazing I imagine it's changed a lot over the years too compared what you all do in this day and age to 15 20 years ago obviously a vast difference well certainly the technologies that have been developed are just amazing so now we can get very uh, answers to very complicated questions. And I think one of the most uh, really amazing things about breast cancer research is that uh, the knowledge that every breast cancer is unique to that individual. And that's really revolutionizing how we think about breast cancer and it's gonna impact on how we treat breast cancer. Sure, I'd like to talk about how the research is funded here in just a moment. I'll mm -hmm. kind of ask you know both of you to okay. talk a little bit about that. But but Patty, I'd like you to discuss if you don't mind how you all work with Vanderbilt and how your you know relationship has been like with Dr. Lanigan and how often you all are, are kind of uh, mixed in conversation. So um, as a local affiliate, we are really fortunate to have Vanderbilt here in our back pocket. Um, over since '92, about nine million dollars have come from. Coleman into labs at Vanderbilt and Excellent. so it uh, provides the opportunity for us to really learn more about the research component and as I said research is vital to finding a cure and as a person who's not involved in research every day it's kind of hard to comprehend it's kind of hard to understand the whole component and so having people like Donna, Dr. Lanigan here able to explain that able to explain to other people what they do really makes a difference absolutely and I would like you to explain Dr. Land again how this research is funded because that's something else that people might not be familiar with well the primary source of funding is by the American taxpayer who and that money from your taxes goes to support the National Institutes of Health and then the second big uh, provider is by private foundations like Coleman. And I would like to point out that government funding has been decreasing for all research over the last decade and has reached one of the lowest levels that it ever has been. And so basically, without money, you don't have research, you will not find cures. So private foundations like Coleman are just crucial for us at this juncture. It's almost as though you rely on those private organizations. Absolutely. Like Coleman, because that's just the other pipeline mm -hmm. of funding for you all, especially when you're talking about the government money not necessarily being allocated the way it used to be. Um, and, and obviously, there's a lot more to research out there nowadays, too. So they probably have to spend their money in different ways, I imagine. As an individual, somebody who's sitting at home, and they're watching today, and they're wanting to know, you know, how can I actually help out? Because I'm one person, I can write a check maybe, or I can maybe go and do the walk or something like that for Susan G. Komen. But what can I do to be able to help in research? What would, what would either one of you say to that? Well, one of the big things that you could do for, for research is to contact 
your uh, government officials, your local and federal elected officials, and tell them that you think that breast cancer research is important, that research is important, they'll listen to you. And really it's grassroots efforts that really um, make a difference to the National Institutes of Health, the NIH budget. So I can't tell you how important everybody is to really making it go. And I think getting involved in affiliates like Coleman is uh, a way of, of showing your support for the researchers. It's, while we're working in the lab alone, it's really nice to know that there's a team out there who really you know, wants us to succeed and is engaged with us. It's, uh, it can be really hard and alone a lot of the times. And you know, to have the comfort of, of knowing that you have people that care what you're doing in the community is really nice. Well said. What would you like to add, Patty? To I, that I would just thought? like to add that I think um, women need to take responsibilities for their bodies, and I know that's not really research-minded, but it is sure, part of the it's very whole important part of, of the whole eliminating breast cancer. And so, really knowing your body, if you have a problem, that you go to your doctor. I think that's really important. I also think when there's studies available that women can participate in, that they do take the opportunity to participate in them, um, that they contact their local officials, that they just, they just act. It, it, you, need to, you need to be progressive. One in eight women still get breast cancer, and even though we've come a really long way, we don't have a cure, and it's gonna take all of us working together to find that cure. Sure, and there's a lot of information out there, obviously, for yes. folks to be able to go and get online and, and just make it happen, but I think what you all both have said today is, you know, again, really important information that some folks might not know. So we so appreciate your time. Again, Dr. Do uh, Deborah Lan, again, Associate Professor over at Vanderbilt University, and also Patty Harmon with the Executive Director of Susan G. Komen here in the Nashville area. Thank you, ladies, so much for visiting with us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Did you know the number of hours you sleep at night can affect your weight? Seven hours of sleep per night help adults control that weight. In a study of more than 21,000 healthy adults, those who actually slept for five hours or less per night were 50% more likely to become obese compared to those who logged a full night's rest. Now, to learn more about healthy sleep habits, visit sleepfoundation.org. As we age, we want to live a healthy life, and we also want to be active in our communities and seek out services and get involved in different programs. Joining us today to talk more about that specifically is Ms. Janet Jernigan, the Executive Director at 50 Forward. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for the opportunity. And what a special celebration. You're celebrating 25 years there, so congratulations. Thank you. That's quite an accomplishment. You all have done so much for the community, and I know a lot of people look to you uh, as a great resource. We should mention right in the beginning, so many people are living longer. We're seeing a lot of people 65 and older nowadays making up a huge population in our world. You so know, they say that um, for all the people who've ever lived to be the age of 65 in the entire history of the world, two-thirds of those are alive today. Isn't that something? What does this mean, Janet, for our communities in general, having that, that population? I think that two things. One thing, on the one hand, it's a great challenge to have the services and programs that are needed for people as they age. On the other hand, it's a tremendous opportunity because you have all those talents and gifts of older people who can volunteer in the community, who can continue to work, who can make a significant difference th throughout the whole area. Absolutely. One thing I think that people probably focus on, some may not, but they should, is just their social life and building that as we age. You know, our friends kind of drift in and out of lives, but how important would you say is it to build that social circle and have that kind of network of folks? Well, there are several things that are really important for longevity, and at the very top of the list is the social connections. And that's uh, one of the main reasons that 50 Forward has all the classes and activities at seven different locations around the community so that people can come in and can meet other people and develop new social relationships. A lot of people have moved here from out of town to be close to their adult children. So they've got to build a whole new social network. Yes, a lot of people also like to jump into healthy activities, but we always have to consider our age and know what you know, we should limit and what we should avoid altogether or things that we should participate in. So when we think of healthy activities for folks, mention some of those things. What would you, what would be your advice for anybody 15 and above? 
Well, I think the thing is, is really just um, what's your physical abilities at this particular point in time. There's sure. so much functional difference between a 50-year-old, you know, and one person being 50 and another person being 50. So it really has to do with you know, what skills and abilities, talents, how flexible are you, and going from there. Uh, I know we had the Mature and Magnificent event several years ago, and we had a woman from Dover, Tennessee, who, uh, when she was 92, went skydiving with her 90 year old brother at her church picnic when she was 70 when she was 94 she showed up on a jet ski <laughs> so you know you really yeah. can't say to people really of any age you shouldn't be doing this because there's always going to be someone who's the exception so you have to kind of know where you are right now and if you want to take on something more challenging you just has, have to do it in smaller steps to get you there visiting with the folks in our community specifically who are that you know age the 50 plus and 65 and over do you find that a lot of these people are really looking at their health more nowadays than ever before and really keeping up good health I think the baby boomers particularly, uh, you know, it's always kind of been about me being <laughs> baby boomers coming along. So folks are really interested in longevity and they're interested in anything that they can do. And all the research really shows that baby boomers have uh, three main things that they're concerned about. One is health and wellness. The other one is continuing lifelong learning. And then the other is caregiving issues as their parents are older or spouses. And that's something that, you know, is, is important over at 50 Forward, too. How does someone become a lifelong learner? Tell us about that, if you will. Well, there are a lot of lifelong learning opportunities, but one of the things about brain research, it shows that you can learn at any age. You never quit learning until you die. So to take advantage of all those opportunities around the community, many through our centers, but there are other programs. Lipscomb's got a great lifelong learning program for older adults. Vanderbilt has the OSHA Institute. So I just say people need to take advantage. Does that, do you think that means picking up a book and reading it, trying something new in terms of a different puzzle or trying to solve something or, or getting yourself into an actual activity that you haven't tried or maybe all of them? All of that. <laughs> so it could be exactly really right. anything. We because have 50 forward first, we call them. So that's getting into those activities that you've never done before. All right, so wh what would you say would be the best opportunities for Middle Tennessee for continued learning for 50 and above? What would you say? Well, I would say certainly in Davidson and Williamson County, come to one of the 50 forward centers and get involved and we'll find any kind of activity that you might be interested in. Try to get a group together that has that same goal and desire. Something that I've always appreciated about 50 Forward is it seems like you could walk into one of the centers and immediately become friends with somebody who shares a certain Absolutely. enjoyment of yours. Obviously, that's a big goal, just as you stated of yours. Do you find yourself trying to implement new programs pretty consistently uh, every, every year, trying to develop something different that you know folks can grab a hold of and say, I want to try this this time? All the time. We had an organizational assessment done several years ago that was standardized on corporations all over the country and it really showed that 50 Forward operates in what's called the innovation stage of development. So we're always innovating. We're always trying to find new things and to help people broaden their whole horizons. Sure. People are also working a lot longer, obviously living longer, you usually do I'm work a little bit longer. <laughs> but you know, at some point you're gonna want to retire. You're gonna wanna have that time with family. But some folks fear retirement in a way because then they, they feel that they'll slow down. What would be your advice for somebody out there who's watching today who would want to know how can I still maintain that great, healthy, active life without having my job every day to mm -hmm. go to? I think it's uh, finding something that gives you real purpose and significance in life, something that you really enjoy, that brings you joy, something you're passionate about. And I was uh, sitting next to someone at a luncheon today who's retired, who had a very responsible community position. Um, she was just talking about she's still able to get involved in causes and as a volunteer, and she doesn't need to get paid, and she has as much, um, I guess, reward from that that she ever did from the career she had. Sure. You always want to obviously try some new things and do some different things, but I know that you've always been such a great role model for a lot of folks too. Having said that, you probably have some advice of things that people might not want to try after they hit a certain age, maybe uh, at 50. Would you have anything regarding 
some of those things that people should probably just avoid once they turn 50? I think the biggest thing people need to avoid once they turn 50 is thinking they're too old to do whatever. But as far as diet and as far as, you know, going out and really just extending yourself, would you say that there are limitations for folks or no? Just, a, is it just? I think it's the same thing that applies to any age. You need to have a healthy, you know, nutritional plan. You need to get regular exercise. You need to be involved with other people. You need to have a significant purpose in life. You need to learn new skills. Those are all the things that contribute to longevity. Sure. They're it all the things that prevent uh, Alzheimer's and other physical disabilities. Sure. And for so many folks, that's when really life begins, is when you embark on this new adventure, whatever that mm -hmm. may be. Miss Janet Jernigan, thank you so much for your time today, and congratulations again on your longevity with 50 Forward. Thank you. Did you know immunizations are a simple, safe, and effective way to protect children and adults from a wide variety of potentially deadly diseases? For vaccines to be most beneficial, they need to be administered on time. That's according to the schedule recommended by pediatricians and the Centers for Disease Control. So protect yourself, your child, and the members of your community around you by getting immunized to protect against preventable diseases. For more information on the benefits of immunizations, visit immunize.org. Measles is a disease that some felt that was eradicated here in the United States. It has made a comeback. So what can you do to keep yourself safe? A lot of people say go get vaccinated. We're going to be talking about the importance of vaccines, how to protect yourself, and this recent outbreak, all with our guest today, Dr. Tim Jones, the state epidemiologist. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. You know, the CDC said in 2000, measles no longer an issue. Now we've seen, you know, the recent outbreak of it. What happened here? What's your take? Well, yeah, in, in the year 2000, uh, the United States, you know, declared that measles was basically eliminated, no longer being transmitted yes. here. Um, unfortunately, it still remained and remains pretty common throughout the rest of the world. So as long as it's anywhere, you know, we, we know that cases will be imported occasionally from travelers and things like that. Um, you know, unfortunately, there are still about 20 million cases a year uh, around the world, and you know, 400 children continue to die every day from measles in other parts of the world. So it's inevitable that we will have the occasional case come here. But we were down to having less than 40 cases uh, in the year 2004, all in travelers. And last year we were up to having more than 600. Wow. So it's unfortunately going the wrong direction. Sure. Now we know a lot of folks have probably watched news coverage of the recent outbreak that we were talking about in the very beginning of this program. Um, somewhat originated in California. They mm -hmm. talked a lot about Disneyland and um, you know that the fact that it spread then to different kind of mm -hmm. states. And as you mentioned, people travel. Were any Tennesseans affected? Uh, I'm very happy to say no. Uh, with that particular outbreak, uh, we don't have any Tennesseans um, involved, and we have not had any cases so far this year, so we're counting our blessings. Yes. But I, there are still a lot of things that can be learned from that outbreak. And let's learn a little bit about measles in general, because for folks who don't know necessarily what the symptoms are mm -hmm. and, and how it's diagnosed, can you kind of go over that information, mm -hmm. please? Uh, measles, it's a, it's a viral infection, so there are not antibiotics, uh, and it's something that can be essentially completely prevented by vaccine. Um, it's a rash illness, so, uh, and it's one that's very, very easy to, to spread. Uh, it's one of the most easily spread diseases that we know of. Uh, if a person gets it, the expectation is that nine out of 10 people that have close contact with them, if they're not vaccinated, will get it. Wow. Uh, which is, that's about as high as it gets in our business. Um, it generally you know, starts out kind of looking like the flu, uh, fever, runny eyes, runny nose, cough. And then after about four days or so, you start with a rash, generally in the head and face. It travels down to the body and eventually down to the legs. Um, and generally the rash starts about two weeks after someone was exposed to the person who had the disease. Oh, okay. Um, 
one of the, the problems is that people can spread the disease a few days before they have the rash and a few days after they have the rash. So, you know, people can still be walking around in the community about to get a rash, not even know that they are infectious and still spread it. Wow. Um, and one of the other scary things about it is that it, it lingers in the air and the environment. So you basically get it from droplets, being around someone who's coughing, sneezing, uh, touching their hands and shaking your hand. But it can also sort of stay in the air for about two hours after the person leaves. So if someone has sneezed in this room and we go out and the next person comes in an hour, they can actually even get measles from that. Wow. Uh, those are all reasons that vaccination is critically important. Yeah, so when you're traveling by plane, obviously that's probably how the cases, you know, Absolutely. kind of happened here. When yes. we were talking about, then all of a sudden different kids showed up in different states with right. it as well. Um, since, I, I know that you mentioned, uh, Dr. Jones, that no one here in Tennessee um, had any issues from this recent outbreak, but since 2000, from the time that, you know, it was considered eradicated, no longer, uh, you know, pertinent here, how many cases have been in Tennessee that you know of? So uh, we're lucky that we have very few cases. We have less than one a year. Wow. So we'll have a case and none for a couple years. Um, about, uh, let's see, last year, actually about a year and a half ago, we had our own little outbreak. So this is one that was not associated with Disneyland. Okay. Uh, it was uh, brought in by a traveler from uh, another country in, in a country where they have a lot of outbreaks. Okay and it spread, it's, we ended up with a total of four cases. Uh, but we re reacted very aggressively and were able to contain it um, and you know, didn't, it basically burned out. We didn't, haven't had any cases since. Can you explain that too a little bit? That interests me when you talk about being able to contain something like, how do you do that? I well, mean, that, that's, a, that's a task. Yeah, and, and that's really one of our primary jobs in public health. For any disease like this, when we first detect it, our immediate job is identifying all of the people that have been around that person with the disease or the case, knowing, and so we interview them, we say, who have you spent time with? Who have you been in a bus with? Who have you been on a plane with? Who do you live with? Interacted in general, yeah. yes. And, okay. and especially with a disease like this. Sure. As fast as we can, we contact those people. And in the case of measles, uh, we either get proof that they've been vaccinated, in which case we know they're safe, or vaccinate them. And actually for measles, if we can get a vaccine into someone uh, within 72 hours of that them having been exposed, so we got that tight window, that's why we move fast, but if we can get that vaccine into them quickly, it actually protects them. Great, all right, let's talk about then more specifically, what percentage of Tennesseans are immunized against measles? Mm -hmm. We actually have a really good record in Tennessee compared to many other places. Uh, we're right up there at the top. We have, you know, over 98% of children that are in the school system that have been vaccinated. All right, I know that, uh, you know, as the state epidemiologist, you probably cringe when you hear people don't want that immunization. Explain to folks in so many words, the importance of something like this and, and being immunized in general for diseases like this that are so highly contagious. I mean, I completely understand that there's, you know, sort of uh, the idea of vaccines can be mysterious, a little bit threatening, and particularly since there's a lot of mis misinformation on the internet. Uh, but vaccines are the most successful public health intervention that we have ever had in this country. Measles is incredibly safe. Um, very few side effects, it's incredibly uh, effective. And as are almost all of our vaccines, I mean, one of the reasons that people get afraid of it is we've never seen the diseases. They've mm -hmm. been so successful that we've never seen the awful consequences of the disease. So a one in a million chance you know, of, of a mild side effect scares us more. But if you talk to people in the generation before me, who've seen people yes, you know, die from, from measles yes. and polio and those awful diseases, they would never in a million years refuse those vaccines. And let me ask you quickly, some, I mean, all school children are not even allowed in school until they get certain vaccines, is that correct? That, that is correct. Uh, in Tennessee, you're allowed to enter school if your uh, parent has a religious objection to getting them. 
and okay. testifies to that. But luckily, over 97, 98% of folks here go ahead and get it. All right. Dr. Tim Jones talking about measles and vaccines, the importance of both. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And thank you all for watching Community Health Matters.